Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning into the part one of a three part series on CCDA to fire mapping project. My name is Cheng Ni, and I'm the vice president of the clinical informatics department here at Availy. Today, we're going to talk about the background of this project, namely, what is the interoperability? What is the important role in healthcare data exchange? What is HR service standards role in enabling interoperability? And going to zoom in into two standards, namely CCD and FIRE, and discuss why it is so hard to map data from one standard to another. Let's get started. So what is interoperability? It is the ability to import utterances from another computer without prior negotiation and have your decision support, data queries, and business rules continue to work reliably against these utterances. So a couple of keywords to highlight from here. One is from another computer. Um, the other is without prior negotiation. And the third part is that last phrase, have your decision support, data queries, and, and other things continue to work. So um, the first one first, um, computer sometimes is referred to as systems or machine. Basically, that means the use case we're discussing here is different than the human readable, human friendly use case, where a human being literally sits behind a computer and trying to read the screen. Um, I can give you another example to just illustrate the difference here um, and why it is important to understand that difference. Um, when I was working at a clinical lab um, and I was counting the lymphocyte count from, you know, reading from a microscope, I can write down my results as 1.2 times 10 star 3 per UL. And I observed my colleagues um, with, with the unit they are using, they can write, write them down as 10 um, capital E um, per 3 per UL. And some wrote down 10 capital X three per UL. And on a lazy day, I even observed somebody saying capital K per UL. Basically, they are all meaning the same thing, 1000 per UL, right? However, um, to a machine, it could have major challenge to try to understand why K per UL means 1000 per UL, because K in machine system can mean a totally different thing. Um, so in order for a machine to understand those are all meaning the same thing. We we require what called what's called um, as prior negotiation um, in this definition. The prior negotiation can typically happen in the format of a mapping. Um, so in this case, um, in order for the machine to be able to process all the four different units as the same way, we need to tell the machine to map ten. 10 E3 per UL, 10 capital X star 3 per UL, and K per UL, all to 10 star 3 per UL, because that's the standard unit. That's the UCOM or unified code of units of measure. Um, that's the way, you know, that's kind of the prior negotiation uh, before the machine can ingest. So, of course, you know, all those kind of unit format are not interoperable, right? Um, and the other highlight in here is to have your decision support or whatever use cases you currently have to be continually supported. So this is a really key concept, which is data as asset. You are acquiring data um, because you need to use the data to support a use case rather than acquiring for the purpose of acquiring itself. So breaking it in another way um, down as HEMS um, help us do, it does have three, uh, four uh, requirements. One is foundational, um, which refers to the physical connectivity um, that's for the upstream to actually send the payload to the downstream. The second one is structural, that is referred to the structural and the syntax at the, at the data field level defined. And then the semantic refers to the underlying model and coding vocabularies and value sets. So think about structural as an individual data um, puzzle pieces. And then semantic is kind of that rule uh, for you to put the puzzle pieces together. And together, you know, you can see it's a tree or it's a dog or something else. And organizational, that's um, kind of that overall framework um, that could include things like security, IT, um, legal, all together to ensure that secure and seamless data exchange. 
And now that we understand what is interoperability, um, we may we may ask why it is so important. In these days, um, thanks to the meaningful use um, that mostly pipes, uh, many pipes are already laid in there. Meaning, if you want to send something from point A to point B physically, um, the pipes might already be there for you to send the payload. And that's where we hear, you know, some clinicians at hospitals are complaining that they, you know, they used to be able to only use the data in their system, but now, you know, they have to literally open up this seven, um, open up um, seven PDFs from seven data sources, and each one of them is 70 pages long. And they're like, they don't have that much time. And for for some others, their complaint is still too little data because when they take a close look at the data, they find that they are like too dirty, they're very hard to comprehend, or maybe they don't have the data elements they want, but they don't necessarily know that before they go ahead and acquire the data. Um, so when they look at what data can actually support their use cases, it's actually still not much. And that's part of the reason why um, people are still, you know, actually building out um, more data uh, connections to more data sources because they still find the need to build more connections um, in order to get the usable data. Um, these days, when we think about the ideal state um, for healthy data exchange, we think about the concept of the right data to the right people at the right time. Um, and to that, we mean the data in their right format, right? In, it's in a machine friendly format so that the downstream can know exactly what the upstream is trying to say. If it's received ICD-10 codes um, from a problem, then it knows that's a diagnosis. Um, and it's just seeing the code and the code system of ICD-10, it will know exactly what diagnosis that is without any pregnant negotiation or other effort trying to uplift the code to an understandable level. Once we have the data in such a usable format, we can then think about, you know, you know, filtering, sorting, slice and dice um, to send to different people and to make different use cases. For example, providers always strive to get the most comprehensive view of a patient versus payers depends on their use case. They may only want to receive a slice of the data so they can just focus on the, the part of the problem that they are focusing on. And at the right time, also highlight that without prior negotiation piece, which means, um, which can take a really long time, um, depends on you know, how good the source data is. If you have your interoperable data that you can use as a fingertip, then you can pull it up um, and serve it up at any time that is right for you. So if we can you know, really do that, then you know, the use case interoperability could unlock include but far exceeds the the these ones that I listed out. Improve patient care because now you can read, you don't have to read a PDF anymore, right? If you receive, you know, seven data sources, they're all interoperable, you can use their data just as if you are using your own data because they're equally, you know, approachable and easy for your machine to understand and for you to you know understand and process these. Um, enhance efficiency um, because there's no additional effort required to uplift the data to a usable status. Data-driven decision-making, of course, because now the data is good, so you can use it to drive your decision-making, your public health, to drive whatever use case AI, NLP, whatever use cases you have, now that you have the data as an asset. And one cannot talk about interoperability without mentioning the important role of the HL7 standards. Um, these standards, you know, purpose of creating those standards is really to provide that common framework and file format for data exchange, for data creation, storing, and exchange. Um, think about, you know, the three uh, sets of standards that uh, HL7 created. HL7 V2 messages, um, that's the earliest created around 90, you know, 80s. They really focus on that single field structural definition because that's kind of the basis for your entire puzzle pieces and, you know, higher level exchange. Um, they did extend a little bit to the semantic where they, uh, some of them have a value set there, but um, for the most part, it's focusing on the structural piece. 
um, CCDA definitely took it, took the V2 standards one step further and built out all the template for the various clinical domains. Um, they specify the terminology binding and the vocab vocabulary and value set binding um, for the different data elements, uh, make it much easier uh, for the implementers to build a consistent um, CCD or CCDA documents. And FIRE is taking the prior standard even one step further um, to define the connectivity. Um, in other words, the that's the standards FIRE APIs that we all know now. Um, and those APIs are actually written into um, our CMS and uh, ONC mandate. Um, so the role of the standard is to you know, facilitate interoperability um, by the fact that you know, we have three standards coexist is actually creating a challenge for interoperability itself. Um, but uh, this challenge is unavoidable, unfortunately, because we cannot just build fire from nowhere. It has to take that stepwise, you know, building up um, from the prior standards and you know, absorb all the lesson learned and, and stuff to really get uh, to, to the um, you know, kind of best so far standards that we have. Um, so the, the problem we're facing here, um, you know, of the different standards coexisting is that, you know, FIRE um, being the most recent standards that's got strong regulatory backup and really immense um, industry activities behind it. Um, if you look at the real world data exchange, most of them are still happening in V2 or CCDA format and not um, FIRE. Um, so that's creating a strong need from the entire industry to convert data from this older standards to the newer standards so that it can support you know, payers and providers meeting their federal mandate. It can support all the downstream fire-based applications and just um, overall unlock a lot more possibilities and potentials. Um, and why we're not doing that? Um, that's because you know converting between standards, specifically here, you know between CCDA and Fire, is very hard. It's very very difficult. Um, and because they have a very different look and feel, and they are really fundamentally different standards. Um, CCDA is based on CDA, which is an XML standard. And it's also a document level standard. Um, so the snapshot you can see, you know, in this um, consultation note, which is one um, type of the CCDA document, it has a couple of components. Um, it have a few components, including a reason for referral, chief complaints, history of present illnesses, general status assessment, and so on and so forth. Versus FIRE, um, you can see here, um, I listed the patient resource. Um, so it is really a resource base. A resource is a sub-document level concept. Patient is a resource, procedure is a resource, condition is a resource, observation is a resource. Um, so the, the unit uh, of the standards is different. And the expression, um, we can see here, the fire is expressed in JSON, even though it has an option to be expressed in XML. Most, if not all, the implementers that we know of are doing it in JSON because it's a much um, flatter and implementer friendly way. And besides this um, kind of on the surface and very obviously structural difference, if you take a close look at you know, the data elements defined um, on the CCDA side and the fire side, the attributes, you'll find very different, um, diff you'll find very different thought processes and approaches from every level. Uh, as an example, CCDA have the concept of a negation which means you can actually negate um, a concept. Um, that means, you know, you can have a patient stating she does not have diabetes, right? That's a diabetes with a negation. Uh, the patient can say, I didn't take this medication. I don't have this allergy. So these are all the concept of negations that CDA or CCDA have a structured way to express it. And negation doesn't exist in FIRE at all. Um, so in order to express the similar concept, um, you know, we have to find different ways for different, you know, clinical domain or resources, for example, for allergies, um, you know, we're trying to map 
kind of a negated allergy from the CCDA side to fire um, as a as um, as a pre as a post court um, using using a, a, a coordinated concept um, from SNOMED or other terminologies. So when the CCDA say a patient is not allergic to your medication, uh, does not have a medication allergies, then the fire um, would have a positive assertion and then have the code being no, no medication allergies. So the code itself would cover um, that negation piece rather than have it structured um, in a you know, in, in the similar way that CCDA does. Um, we use the code to, to cover that negation. Um, and so this is for our first part of the session. And in our next session, we're going to um, talk more about, you know, in part of the H07 uh, CCDA to fire mapping group, how we um, our approach, how we are approaching, you know, this challenge uh, using a couple of different ways. How we're engaging the industry vendor um, in this journey, um, and some of the milestones we have achieved. Um, thank you very much for your attention.